Well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for showing up today at this important meeting. Uh, we're going to vote in our new board and all that. And I want to thank everyone for the uh, affirmation to put me in the position as president. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege, as we all know. <clears throat> My talk is going to be about trying to wrestle back American medicine from all the corporate entities, pretty much, that are out there driving uh, what medicine should be in their view. We have the boards, we have administrators, we have legislators. We are becoming more and more employees and guidelines. I've, I've never been a big friend of guidelines ever since hearing that 80% of what we know about medicine uh, is not validated by uh, proof. And when I see President Trump being treated with non-FDA approved treatments because they're very expensive, uh, while the less expensive, i.e. hydroxychloroquine is not being allowed, widespread use. It's, it's very disturbing and I think it should disturb all of us. The year 2020 has been a rather challenging year for us all. And uh, one of the downsides of coming last is I hope to not to try to repeat too much information that's already been presented, but I was gonna talk about COVID also. First of all, the AAPS, I came to APP at AAPS and found it to be a uh, sensible society with a motto, all for the patient. It's been around an awful long time. Uh, I was surprised that it existed when I first discovered it um, eight, nine, 10 years ago, uh, back when the maintenance of licensure was an issue back in Ohio. And with myself and another AAPS member, we went to the uh, State Medical Society and caused maintenance of licensure nationwide to be put on the back burner. It's still on the back burner. I don't think it's gone away. The Federation of State Medical Boards will keep trying to push for maintenance of licensure under the auspices of maintenance of certification. And the, the effects of corporate entities in America imposing themselves on medicine are significant. And I think as a society, we need to try to grow. I know uh, direct patient care has been the main thrust of AAPS for a very long, very long time. And historically, that's what medicine was but we need to try to reach out to all physicians, the employed physicians, the university uh, professors, because medicine affects us all. As we get older, we are going to become, if not physicians, patients. And that's important for us to maintain medicine the way it should be. Now, COVID, one of the biggest problems I've seen this past year with COVID is the uh, unintended consequences associated with it. And one of the biggest ones I think is that is also not mentioned, but Jane touched on just, just moments ago was the fact that the uh, secretion or the seclusion of the patient from the rest of the family is very detrimental to patient care. When my wife was hit by a truck and went to the hospital, there was not a minute when she was in the ICU that she did not have a friend or one of the family there to advocate for her. And twice during her hospital stay, I saved her life. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, occlusion of the endotracheal tube as a paraplegic, quadriplegic in individual. And when they decide to put in a, uh, a, a chest tube, they accidentally hit the spleen and I had to diagnose a little hypovolemic shock associated with the best care in the area. The election year politics, I think I'm going to leave that for now. We've, we've, we've heard enough about that in the previous um, discussions. There are gonna be leadership transitions and we all must take a role in trying to see that the transition goes in a sensible direction. Again, our, our, our society needs membership. Everyone should try to make others aware of the AAPS as uh, it is not well known among those coming up through the ranks because of the impositions of the corporate entities, a AMA, and as well as the various boards uh, imposing upon us. And um, the controls that are, are evident over physicians as they mature through their professional lives. And in anesthesia, I, you know, we, don't, we do not need to only worry about the hospitals who are run by non-physicians who dictate medical care, but there are also physician and as we said earlier, uh, private um, financial institutions that are trying to take over medicine. Uh, increasingly, we must combat this fourth influence in medicine by trying to maintain connections with all physicians. The government, the boards, uh, the employer controls are very intrusive 
and increasing and deserve more attention by us as a society. I think I can skip over most of this. Again, the FDA approval issue. There are no FDA approved treatments for COVID, but we've all realized there are things that we can do to mitigate the impact of this disease. And the big problem that I have noted was the, the total hysteria created around this disease. And I'm gonna go into the numbers a little bit more uh, in, in a few moments. Um, the constitutional violations are unintended and significant. Again, if family members are excluded from patient care, how can we assure that these patients truly get the care they need? In many instances, having an advocate for the patient is one of the single most important things. And when patients go into these systems of hospitals, their primary care physician who knows them, cares about them, is often excluded, leaving truly only the family members. And often in this day and age of COVID, family members are limited to one family member for the whole hospital stay to reduce introduction of I don't know what, and or nobody at all. And I think a great deal of patients have died because of lack of advocacy. Now this, this, uh, this slide pretty much says it all for me. I can remember back in January watching the evening news and they came on and said, we're having a war on COVID. And back on D-Day, our soldiers fought the Germans and, and jumped into the waters off of France and went in there. And now our job is going to be to sit on a on a couch and isolate ourselves. If we declared war on COVID, it was the first war in the history of mankind that I've ever heard of, where the government decided to stop producing bullets when they needed them most. We didn't have masks, we didn't have ventilators, and, and the push by our experts who, you know, if you ask a surgeon about a problem and you ask an internist about a problem, you probably may get two very different answers. And when we ask Dr. Fauci, who's an epidemiologist, the answer to infection is always to isolate, it seems. Treatment may not be uh, the right answer for these people. And the problem, as I saw it was, again, COVID was a, a great unknown. We created a lot of the hysteria and fear, and we've maintained it to this very day by the, the false media or the, the, the hypocrisy of media. Up in the right corner, you see freedom, terms and conditions apply. We all have to fight for our freedoms. We all have to fight for our freedoms as doctors. And right now, I think there's increasingly a need to fight for the profession of medicine because of the multiple attacks upon the physician profession by outside forces. Another thing that I saw early on in January was well, suddenly there were healthcare professionals, nurses particularly, who were who are saying on TV, I never signed up for this. I'm sorry, we, I've been doing medicine for 40 years and when AIDS came along, I'm putting needles in patients and running needle stick infection risks uh, in the face of AIDS. And back then the goal was to have universal precautions. And I think that's a lesson that we failed to bring home to the American public. Henry Ford once says, anyone who wants to rely on the government from the cradle, of the, from the cradle to the grave could go, should go and talk to the American Indian because the government is not going to solve your problems. Ronald Reagan has also emphasized this to us uh, with his statement that you know, the biggest thing you could fear is having the government show up and say we're here to help. We needed to teach people to every American to stand up for their rights, their freedom and their health and protect themselves as individuals. When those soldiers jumped off the barge going onto the French shores, they were going, we knew there were going to be uh, deaths, acceptable losses, as we call it. And I think Jane showed us some curves which showed that there are deaths associated with COVID, but maybe we have to recognize that some of this is in some, every death is bad, but some of them are going to have to be acceptable losses relative to the unintended consequences of doing what we have been doing. Is America the worst case scenario? You know, I think we were shown a number that showed America to have the greatest deaths per 100,000 patients or, or, or population on a statistical basis. But again, we've also heard that we really don't know if everything that's being reported as a COVID death is truly a COVID death. And I, 
and I think I'll be able to show some information in that regard to substantiate that it's not the, tr the, the, the truth. The CDC and our experts have failed us. The first thing I did when I heard about COVID was I ordered 20 N95 masks online because I knew being an anesthesiologist, I wear masks every day, almost all day long, and it didn't seem a big deal to me, but it's a means of protection of those around me and to mitigate the, the, the risk of uh, inhaling COVID virus into myself. And it doesn't uh, eliminate the risk, it mitigates it. And we all needed to practice personal mitigation for our own personal health. Um, the issue of, uh, of, of deaths again in this side, and I, I would advise everyone to take a look at this. This is from the CDC and we can see, I don't know if, if you follow the curve across here, this is the yellow line defines when excess deaths occur. And I've tabulated, you have to go and add all these numbers out individually where the red crosses on the right are. And if you look at it, you see there's 60,000 deaths a week, but then a thousand deaths or as many as maybe uh, 2,500 deaths a week when the peak was there in the original curve, which you can see here. And if you go off here, it stops and it does drop off at the end. Some of that may be related to the fact that deaths will come in after 14 days and make the numbers go up. But the overall data shows that it's not, we were not getting another surge. And the whole concept of the initial uh, sequestration of people and social engineering of exclusion was to mitigate this huge peak, which they anticipated because they were afraid there wouldn't be ventilators for everyone. I can't, I'm unaware of any person who was put on a ventilator with a, a second person because there was a shortage. But I do know that in the interim, we found out that getting put on ventilator may not have been the right thing to do for everyone because that uh, contributed to deaths. Our leadership vacillated. They first, they said, don't wear masks, masks, let it go all go to the healthcare providers. And then you'd see healthcare providers with one, two, three masks on instead of just the one that they need uh, with tremendous waste of uh, PPE. And the fact that a week ago, you would only wear, you know, when I, when I was working a year ago, you're supposed to put a mask on when you go in the operating room, if you pull it down, you tear it off and throw it away. Well, now we couldn't even throw them away. We had to keep them and reuse them and re-sterilize uh, re them for weeks at a time. Again, we should have been producing PPE as soon as we are, were aware of the problem. The downside is, I think most of it comes from China where the whole problem originated. Uh, you know, our leadership has failed us. Our experts are experts in their own right and they have not evaluated the downside or the unintended consequences of their recommendations. And why might America be one of the worst case scenarios? Maybe Americans are just frankly unhealthy as a, as a population. Our obesity is tremendous. We have COPD. We have a lot of health care issues that are not prevalent in other societies, particularly other societies where they don't live to 75 years of age, but perhaps only 55 or 65. Um, the thrust for tests there have been reports on you know, 60 Minutes about the fact that they rushed all these tests on the market. In the initial phase of COVID, we were defining COVID based on assumption and, and, and clinical indices without any valid tests. And then they let over 100 different tests onto the market, of which really only five or six were actually validated for any degree of accuracy. And none of them are 100% accurate. We seem to have a, a, a a concept that testing helps. And I don't believe that testing helps. We don't do an EKG on everybody. We don't do a blood test of any kind on everybody to screen for some rare uh, disease. But this is, I think, a rare disease. They set up these uh, street testing centers. When I saw that, I asked myself, who would go there? You're going into the mouth of the lion. If you stick that probe into my nose, the first thing I'm going to do is cough or sneeze on you. And the people out there on the street, there are no hand washing facilities. They change their gloves between patients. And if you've ever changed gloves, you know that you will contaminate yourself around the areas. Getting scrubbed for surgery is a very particular thing that needs to be done uh, in a very hygienic manner. And I don't think the hygiene was out there on the streets. We may have caused more disease than we identified. 
But let's look at the numbers. Is COVID really uh, this, this, this crazy disease that's ramping its way through America and the world? On September 30, I pulled out the numbers that there were 7 million cases in the United States and with 328 million citizens, that is a COVID rate of about 2%, and I can't really, you know, it's 2%. Of the 211,000 deaths that were known in America or defined as COVID deaths, that's only 3% of those people who got COVID who died from it. So the death rate from COVID in the United States is 0.06%. And with 208 million US deaths a year, it's only 7.5% of all deaths, and, and we're assuming that those reported are truly due to COVID, which I doubt. Now, we don't want the schools open, apparently. I think if we don't send the kids to school, they're going to suffer. Uh, America has long been described as an educational vacuum, and now we're going to stop kids from going to school. That doesn't seem to be a good thing. I think there are unintended consequences of that. I think having people sit at home has probably contributed to the riots in the streets in the summertime when people have nothing better to do with their lives. They may con conglomerate and raise uh, trouble in the cities. But of all COVID deaths, only 0.026% are in kids under the age of 15, and I'll get back to that. So we have to really ask ourselves, I mean, every death is a tragedy. Uh, some deaths are less tragic than others, especially if you're 99 years old, it may be deemed a little less tragic. And in my, uh, my life experience in many rural hospitals, when patients hit the age of 75, oftentimes, particularly in the hospital employed physicians environment, many patients are deemed to be less valuable in terms of need to invest money into their health care because they're on their way out. But everyone deserves optimal care the question is, are our leaders giving that to us? Um, this is a curve, I think, which, show, which is very important. It shows by the various age groups, and the older groups are up here at the top, the, the count of deaths over the weeks. And you can see that most of the deaths are in the elderly, and those under the age of 45 and 50 are way down here. And this is in uh, counts per, per 100,000 uh, in that age group. So we see that there is a very skewed death rate to the elderly who are uh, 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 at risk. And here we see, this is from uh, the CDC itself, and we look at the percentage of COVID deaths, and they really get significant once you hit 55 to 64, but 80% of the deaths are in patients over the age of 65. Well, kids aren't at risk. Why don't we let them go to school People usually retire, well, should retire by the age of 65. So the workforce of America is not really at that large of a risk. And COVID, like the cold, the common cold, is a, can be a coronavirus virus. It's, I don't think it's going to go away. It's going to pass through society. And we talk about a herd phenomenon. If we let the people who aren't at risk come in contact with the coronavirus as they deem fit, we may ultimately immunize our society against the, the, the deadly effects of the virus. Again, if there's a war on COVID, when you're jumping off onto the beach to, to France, there are uh, people, every, every soldier is behooved to try to protect themselves, but win the war. And that should be the message, in my opinion, that should be out there. It's everyone's responsibility to try to maintain health, Get rid of your unhealthy lifestyles wherever possible. They've told us what we need to do to prevent COVID, and we need to put the responsibility to the population at large and turn the economy back on. Let the young go back to work. Let the kids go back to schools, and let the elderly, particularly those in nursing homes and that, stay in a secluded, protected environment and limit access to these people from outside uh, personnel. And the whole concept of testing, Donald Trump has COVID. Everybody was tested around Donald Trump, daily almost, and yet that didn't protect him. I think this whole emphasis on testing is, should be limited to people who are suspectedly infected or have symptoms, and it's a great waste of money, 
and a great opportunity to promote fear when people cannot get tested. You know, I went and had my yearly labs drawn and I put on the ticket to draw my uh, COVID antibodies because I think I might have had COVID months ago, but I could not get that drawn and tested because the hospital doesn't care about that. They would rather diagnose you with active COVID. So to make a quick uh, sidestep, um, the medical boards, the, that's one of the main problems that I've been interested in over these past years, for the past 10 years. I'm one of the first people who really attacked the issue. And the medical boards and multiple ABMS boards have granted exceptions to relicensure and certification due to the COVID. Again, emphasizing the arbitrariness of these things. You know, what is a license? That is rendering your right, your freedom under the Constitution to the government to sell back to you every year. And the, Amer and the American boards are no different. Telemedicine has suddenly become florid in the United States, where before there were great concerns and there have been uh, great uh, leniency ex expunded by the various boards to allow medical licensure transfer across straight lines. So these things are all held over our heads for the ability of the medical boards and the ABMS to earn money off of physicians who are seen as the golden goose. Um, again, I, I'm going to jump over this slide, but I got into this back with maintenance, or maintenance of licensure. And in Ohio, where it was going to be the pioneer attempt to introduce maintenance of licensure, not just board certification, but your ability to get a license, we fought that on the state level with the state medical society. And I think AAPS in each state needs to reach out to the state societies who are not making money off of this board certification, particularly where there is a lot of interest in fighting it in the past. When these things come up on the state level, people can be mobilized. The fact that we're now talking about the board certification on a federal level is a serious problem because the boards weren't stupid. They, they saw an opportunity to slide this in along the back door to uh, uh, allow it to go over a period of 20 years now that it's been a problem and to develop a system of uh, uh, not me, it doesn't affect me among the vast number of physicians who then suddenly in 2010 were confronted with the fact that, with the fact that their certifications were suddenly expiring and that's what brought 2010 in the fight against certification to the forefront. Having been looking at certification for the last 10 years, I can honestly say it is the monkey on the back of American economy because certification exists in almost every area you would care to look as an introductory phenomenon, as a certified accountant, as a certified crane driver, a certified, you name it, and there's a certification in the industry out there living off the backs of hardworking people. And the fact that it's slapping doctors in the face is because the ABMS has changed board certification into a, not a one-time event, but a yearly subscription that if you don't pay, although they put on their original uh, board cert certifications, it was good for 10 years, they would pull it the first year you didn't make your payments. So it's an extortion racket. It's, it's a Sherman Act violation. And I think we're gonna get behind that. Um, I'm gonna flip over this. It, sh it simply shows that over the years, and this is from 2017, that the certification rate in, in anesthesia residencies was dropping off as we hit the 2010 uh, 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 date. Because those of us like myself who have a lifelong cert certification probably never really even got involved with the system. And those who were f suddenly uh, being forced to recertify, remember in 2000 is when all certs, all board certifications were 10 years uh, dependent, we found people were starting to renege on their recertification by not participating in MOC in significant numbers. People do not want to pay extortion money. And that's exactly what it is. At that point in time, the, the American uh, Board of Anesthesiology put this out there and says, uh, the success rate has been typically been greater than 90% from 2005 to 2016. A total of 7,483 diplomats have successfully completed the MOCA program as of December 30, 31st, 2016, six years into the obligate need to have MOCA. 
but there were 54,000 ASA members and over 40,000 anesthesiologists practicing in America. This, they, it's, it's typical fake news. They're describing this number of 7,000 where people have been forced to sign up as a win, although it's a very small proportion of anesthesiologists indicating nobody wanted it. Now, on se September 22nd, we got the verdict back from our initial uh, lawsuit against the um, American Board of Medical Specialties. And I was astounded that they would issue a verdict without ever having a hearing. And I, I understand that we are going to appeal this, and I think we will be able to appeal it from what Andy Schlafly has said to, to me. And I think it will be important to push this forward to win this victory. Again, the other problem is administrators. People who work in hospitals are told what they need to do. Again, when my wife was in the hospital at a university clinic where I used to work, where the anesthesia personnel knew me personally, she was um, uh, basically succumbing to pneumonia from ventilator-associated ventilator pneumonia. And when I looked at the, the regimen, they were using toothpaste and chlorhexidine to wash out the mouth of the patients twice a day who are intubated. And of course, that secretion will accumulate, move its way down, and it will flow into the lungs around the endotracheal tube cuff because the cuff facilitates a water seal and fluids flow through it. Well, having looked into it, chlorhexidine and toothpaste are both known pulmonary toxins. It would have made a great deal of sense if they would have used whatever antibiotic solution which they could give intravenously to keep the teeth clean. But because dentists have advocated chlorhexidine and toothpaste, that's what was used in my wife. And the only way she turned her, um, her pneumonia around was by getting a tracheostomy, which allowed, allowed all the fluid to flow out the front. Again, I've never been a friend of guidelines. That's what was killing my wife was the guideline. And fortunately, she made it around the guideline. And we all need to be aware of these factors that guidelines and administrators and non-experts, non-physicians are increasingly being pushed into the healthcare role in medicine, and we need to uh, fight that. We talk about the money. This is, a, I think, a, an astounding uh, pie chart here where you can see this blue. This is all the money paid to physicians. These are all the other healthcare providers, and this is everything else from uh, hospital administrations, uh, computer uh, purchases, medical equipment, etc. We as physicians are blamed for the overwhelming healthcare costs, but we really don't get much of the money to us, and that's hurting us in trying to fight uh, for the rights of patients in healthcare. The big winners in modern healthcare, again, Microsoft, the software and computer industry, they're making billions. There's a, on every desk, you have to have a computer nowadays insurance companies, and especially the CEOs who make one to two to three million dollars or more a year, hospital systems, pharmaceutical companies. I think that's why hydroxychloroquine has been on the back slider here in fate, while the other much more expensive therapies have been uh, promoted. I'm going to move on here in the interest of time. And I found this to be a very interesting joke, which I read. Gee, Bernie, I wish I'd gone straight into politics or hospital administration after college. I could have avoided that decade of study and years of self-denial to become the expert in healthcare, meaning a physician. These pseudo healthcare experts are, are walking around with clipboards, defining things for the patients, for the doctors, how we have to act. And we need to take back medicine as physicians. The Flexner report back in 1910 indic indicated to the American public and the experts in our country that we needed to uh, standardize medical education to the benefit of the doctors and the population of America. But unfortunately, um, as this, this um, slide shows, we are having more applicants than we do have positions to train people in the first year positions. And the other problem is healthcare providers, we are now competing directly with um, other pseudo-professionals who are practicing medicine without a license to practice medicine. Doctors have licenses to practice medicine. PAs get it, get their license through the medical boards, but they were originally introduced to assist doctors. But now we are finding nurses, particularly, practicing medicine 
under the nursing board without a medical license and without the oversight of the medical boards who are afraid to sanction uh, nurse practitioners because they're afraid they will, they will step on toes and create political waves. But we find as physicians, uh, we are held to a much higher standard, including board certification and fees and trying to compete with this. We are seeing physicians push out of practice in favor of nurse practitioners, especially in the employee and hospital environment to the fact that these nurses are even trying to sell themselves as doctors. And I know Chris held earlier in her, uh, her presentation mentioned the fact that people don't know who their doctors are, whether they're nurse practitioners or PAs. We need to stop calling them doctors and, and differentiating providers from physicians so that we can promote our, for our uh, profession because it is under attack. This is uh, an attempt by nurses to define themselves as doctors. We've had nurses sue to be able to allow themselves to be called anesthesiologists, which is typically reserved for physicians. And in 18 states in this United States under Medicare laws, nurses are allowed to practice anesthesia without any supervision by physicians as a financial uh, reality of the Medicare laws. Again, I'm going to flip through this real quick. 10,000 years, uh, 10,000 hours of clinical medicine to become a family medicine physician, and maybe 500 years of clinical hours, maybe 1,500 for a nurse practitioner. And, uh, you know, we have the, the educational uh, uh, commitments here clearly defined uh, for nurse practitioners. It can go as long as seven years, but five and a half years, whereby four years is basic education and very little clinical uh, human is uh, involved in, in training a nurse practitioner. Many nurse practitioners will graduate from a general educational system, which may be totally online with few uh, clinical hours and then be introduced into an emergency room or into a uh, neurosurgical specialty unit and become experts or specialist nurse practitioners in just a few weeks under the uh, training by a expert physician. We've been trying to work around the hospital, the insurance, and the government for too long. AAPS with the independent, you know, private practice is very important for this particular area, especially, but we need to reach out and try to draw in all of these other physicians who, again, with us are under attack in order to attack the problem. There is strength in numbers, and we need to recruit more numbers and get our message out. The Interstate Medical Licensing Compact, uh, it's, it's astounding. The nurses have ha had this for uh, over, over 25 years. And when you as a nurse in one state sign up for the nursing compact, you pay your $120 fee and you are now able to go with your home state license into any of the compact states without spending another dime. In the Physician Interstate Medical Licensing Compact pushed by the FSMB, if you have a home state of West Virginia, you buy your license in West Virginia, you pay $800 to the compact, and then that allows you to buy your license at every other individual state at the normal price in order to go and practice. Physicians are being priced out of the market. We are seen as the goose that laid the golden egg by every type of administrative uh, liaison or corporation that is out there. So my goals as president with the AAPS this year is to serve freedom and the members. We need to invite new members and ideas. We need to talk about the problems of doctors with all our colleagues. When you get those uh, um, uh, newsletters from Jane in the mail every month, don't leave them at home. Take them in a hospital, put them in a surgeon's lounge. Let other people read them. There are very good messages in there, as we all know, and uh, we need to put our message out there and strengthen the practice of medicine by physicians for the patients without intrusion by non-medical personnel. Uh, the problem with medicine is we see ourselves as specialists. The boards have divided us. We don't see ourselves necessarily as a physician group. We need to cultivate this concept of it, of it that we are all in this together and encourage each physician we know to become a member. Um, we need to strengthen the profession as a profession. 
And again, the truth will set you free. This is what stands above the uh, first uh, educational building of my University of Freiburg. Why I have been so involved in this uh, maintenance of certification thing is because I trained in Europe. I saw how things were over there. Small countries, they interacted with each other. There was mobility between countries. Here in America, the whole concept of board certification was to prevent physicians to come in and compete with physicians in America. That time is gone. It's an antiquated concept. We are now competing with nurses, chiropractors, naturopaths, you name it. There's no need to exclude physicians from the physician market. That is only facilitating the takeover of the profession of, mer of, 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 of uh, America, the, the physician profession by non-physicians. And again, I wanna thank everyone for your support. I've enjoyed this meeting immensely. I'm very happy that we had so many people show up and I will turn over the microphone at this time. Thank you very much.